Um, hi, good to be here today. Um, I wonder if anybody recognises the um, image on my title slide. This is, uh, I'll give you a clue, it's not far away from here, are there? So there's at least one of you. Are there any librarians here? Okay, so, <laughs> so you, you might choose to disagree with this, but what I was going to—I was going to kick off by saying, but so I'm here to talk about the impact of technology in HE, and I think that libraries have been um, particularly at the at the vanguard of that. If you think there would have been a time when, if you'd said, "What what does a library do?" Well, we we get some books and some journals, and we we put them on shelves, and you know all of this, and and now even the, even the very ownership of the, the resources in the library, well, it's, it's becoming more of a Spotify model. We rent access to e-journals and databases, maybe also textbooks for, um, for our students. I, I was meeting with your librarian, uh, Claire Pound, yesterday, and she was telling me about that shifting dynamic to increasingly, the stuff is online first, and people still feel that they need a library there's something deep-seated, it's deep-rooted, it's psychological, it's the academic heart of the institution. But if we're brutally honest, actually, if, if we had to, if push came to shove, you know, could we do without the physical building when so much of the stuff is online nowadays? There are a few institutions that have actually tried this, and there's a couple in the States that have tried this. I don't know if anybody saw in, in China, they just opened this incredible new library, which I, I almost use as the background picture here, uh, which has this kind of giant uh, globe in the middle of it. You maybe saw it in the papers. There are no books, actually. The books are just wallpaper. Somebody, somebody came in to take a good look at it, and they discovered that the shelves and shelves of books are actually just wallpaper. So I don't, I don't know what that tells us, but <laughs> it's interesting. And I also thought the, the pattern here in the background was absolutely wonderful and, and having popped up yesterday I had a good look around the forum development here and it's just it's just incredible. I think if I was if I was a student coming to Exeter, I would just want to hang out there all the time. And it's it's a nice thing actually to, to think, you know, if you're a if you're a student at a university, there are places like that that you will positively want to go to, you will want to be there, you'll want to hang out there. So we, we've heard a little bit of a, a dystopian message earlier on. I'm going to try and make it a bit more, a bit more positive um, today. But I'm also conscious that I'm, I'm here from JISC, and you use our services every day, but you probably uh, don't really know anything about us. So we run, we run Janet and EduRome and JISC Mail, things that you, you probably encounter every day. You might not know you're using Janet, but when you jump onto EduRome, you connect out onto the internet. We're your internet service provider. So that's a roundabout way of saying if, you, if you're trying to use it and it doesn't work, <laughs> come and find me afterwards. <laughs> but um, we've got about 18 million people using Janet, and actually 40% of schools in the UK use Janet. And we, we like to think perhaps it could be 100% in the future because this is all publicly funded. And I think there is an underlying theme, which I'll come back to later on, about where... where the public purse has paid for something, actually, can we get the, the best value out of it? So it's, I, I call it a moral imperative, and I'll, I'll come back to that later on. Um, but yeah, so we, we run some of these services you use every day. We also do uh, deals for products. So I suspect here at Exeter, you're on Microsoft Office 365, so you get your email and calendar and everything through that. And we negotiated a, a national deal for that. And we're always on the lookout for other deals with IT companies, also with publishers. Again, speaking to the library space, we do, do quite a bit with publishers already. Um, and we do quite a bit of work on advice and guidance. So uh, if there is a, a, an upcoming technology which could be quite impactful, what could you do with it? And actually... You know, we, we tend to think about technology sometimes as a threat, but it's, sometimes it is a threat, but sometimes it's also a huge opportunity. So with, with that in mind, I'll give you what I call the brain hat. So this is a piece of kit that my team is um, experimenting with right now. And the brain hat is not really called that. It's called the emotive insight. It's, uh, it's an EEG headset 
So it's, it, if you've ever um, been to uh, an NHS clinic and had an EEG um, headset on, you know they're kind of typically they're covered in sensors. You probably need some gel sticks to your hair, which is never never good. Although not a problem for me. Um, real pain to get on and off, and actually you can't really use it outside the lab. So that's proper clinical grade instrument. And we found there's things like this. This is 250 quid. This is basically a consumer product uh, that they sell for kind of mindfulness and also to fly drones with. So you can fly a drone with this. Now, although it's, it's not a clinical grade product, it's only got a few sensors. If you were a, an NHS consultant, you'd probably say, hold on, <laughs> I'm not going to get anything useful out of this. It's good enough to fly a drone with. And we did a, a little thing uh, just recently where we, we took this to the Vice Chancellor's Conference, Universities <coughs> UK. And we actually had Vice Chancellors coming up and trying it on. We were mapping their brains. So we actually know what goes on inside the brain of a, of a Vice Chancellor, which is, which is good. I've got my, got my retirement plan all sorts of yeah. pension. <laughs> what was really fascinating about that, though, was we, we got them to put the headset on, and you could see different areas of the brain were active. And sometimes there were areas that weren't really active at all. And, and what I'm going to try and do today, I think in this sort of setting, typically, um, there's a tendency for everyone to kind of go, ah, ah, okay, I'm, I'm listening, someone is talking at me. So I'm going to try and make you uh, think a bit and, and do a bit of talking yourselves as well, so it won't just be me. But when we did this with the vice chancellors, uh, we discovered that if you get people to translate, and several of them were, knew quite a few languages, so we had the principal of the University of Edinburgh, and we said, okay, um, how many languages do you know? And he's like, ah, they we, ah. <laughs> and he, he, I think he knew about six languages. And you could see these different areas of his brain firing up. When we started talking, they were doing nothing at all. And as he... Uh, you know, went back into his long-term memory as he was trying to do a bit of real-time translation. And vroom, little areas of his brain lit up. So I, I think that's really fascinating. You know, something like this, it's not free, but it's not very expensive. And you think about a scenario like this where you're suddenly put up in front of a load of people and you could be quite nervous, so you, maybe you've never done anything like this before. Um, or you're a lecturer and you have a class full of people in front of you, and you think, am I losing them? It's, that, that guy over there is falling asleep, I'm sure of it. Um, maybe if you, if you handed a few of these out, you could get a little sample of <laughs> what your audience is, is thinking. <laughs> anyway, that's stuff <enough> about others. <laughs> so what I, what I wanted to do now, I've got really three bits to this. Um, I want to encourage us to think about analogue and digital, and I'll explain what I mean about that in a moment. I'm going to look at a few upcoming technologies that I think are going to have quite a big impact, not just on, on HE, but probably more generally. And then I'm, I'm going to ask us all to kind of gaze into our crystal ball and think about where we see technology specifically in, in higher ed. So first off, what analogue or digital, what, what do we mean by that? Well, I'm going to play a game. So the game is called How Digital Are You? And I've got some um, warm-up questions here to get you thinking about this. So question number one, you're reading for pleasure. Would you choose to read an e-book or a paper book? So if you choose to read an e-book, put your hand up. And if you choose to read a paper book, put your hand up. Oh, wow. so that's pretty, that's pretty pronounced. So if... I'm recording this, by the way, so for, for people who are watching on the recording, um, what, you, what you didn't see was nearly everybody in the room putting their hand up and saying, I'd, I'd prefer to read a paper book. So for the purposes of this uh, conversation, we'll call you analogue, at least in that, in that respect. You know, you can't, you can't easily read a Kindle book in the bath, and if you drop your <coughs> Kindle in the bath, they're not really waterproof yet. Maybe they'll do that one day. Um, next one, and, and maybe this, maybe we'll see the tables turn a little bit here. Um, how many times you've checked your, let's call it, social networks today? So, I don't know, uh, five times or less so far today. Put your hand up. Oh, 
Okay, so that's most people. That's most people again. Um, let's say ten times or less. So, oh, sorry, I should say between five and ten. So, anybody more than ten? Oh, I have a winner. <laughs> So I'm, I'm a bit of a, a social media fan too, so you, you and I, we should, we should connect with each other. <laughs> would, it, would it have been a lot different if you weren't here? Yeah. Uh, could, not, no. could you have done this online is always an interesting question. I mean, for those of you who didn't check a lot, would it have been different if you weren't in this environment? Would you have checked a lot if you were at your desk or whatever? Or would it have been the same? Same. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, but for the, for the video record, <coughs> we've, got, we've got a... A group of people who who they're not massive social media addicts. Maybe maybe this next one will bring out a bit more of, of the digital in you. So let's let's picture you've you've got a whole bunch of meetings lined up. Are you going to print the notes out, print the agenda, print the papers out, and scribble on them, or are you going to bring a laptop or or an iPad or something and do that electronically? So who's going to print them out? And who's going to bring a device? Oh, so it's so far it's looking, you, you're a pretty, pretty analogue audience today. That's nothing to be ashamed of. I'm, I'm, not, <laughs> I'm not dissing you in any way. You know, it's just interesting to think about. Because we talk about this stuff all the time. We tend to assume that everybody is like... And in fact, we did a, we did a survey of students recently, 22,000 students. Over half of them said, my university or college just assumes that I live, eat and breathe technology. They just assume that they can give me an app, they can give me some website, and just, there you go, just figure it out. And actually what students told us is, a lot of them are terrified by that. They're, frankly, they're, they're terrified and they need, they need support. So don't just throw something at them, work with them, help them to understand it and help them to not feel uh, threatened by it. So here, my final warm-up question here, to get those brain cells going, email addresses. So how many email addresses do you think you have? Um, let's say, oh, I don't know, uh, one. Do, do you mean that you actually use? Not necessarily, that you, that you have, <coughs> that, you, that you own or have been assigned. What do you say? Does anybody think they only have one email address? Ah, well, let's say two. Mm -hmm. uh, three, four, <laughs> five. Oh, oh, anybody with with six or more? Oh, and I should have known you would. <laughs> <laughs> what do you two do? <laughs> uh, okay, okay. So, so for the for the video there, what we saw was um, actually quite I'd say quite an even spread of people people with. Um, lots of email addresses. I'm betting that you don't actually necessarily use all those email addresses actively. Another thing we hear from students is that, um, that the institution doesn't necessarily meet them in the places where they would expect to be contacted. And so, you know, let, let's, let's um, look at it in diagrammatic terms. So for the people video conferencing in, we're looking at the diagram up on the right hand side here. This is a little tool that we've used. Um, if, if we had more time, we'd run a little workshop here and get you to draw your own picture. What you probably can't see is there are two axes on that diagram. The um, horizontal has the word visitor on one side and resident on the other. The vertical has personal at the top, institutional at the bottom. And this is a, a great tool. This is developed by a, a guy at the University of uh, the Arts uh, London called Dave White. Um, what we do is we get people to look at the, the tools, the apps, the services that they use and put them somewhere in that um, grid. So what in that particular diagram, we've got a, a medic who's put a whole bunch of, of quite specialist services, BMA Library, British Medical Journal, Student Edition, things like that. We're very much in the institutional space. And then over on the right hand side, they've got Facebook. And interestingly, Facebook kind of straddles the institutional and the personal. And right in the middle, online cloud storage, something like Dropbox, 
that completely crosses all boundaries, crosses all borders. And we, we, we touched on uh, GDPR, the incoming um, privacy regulations earlier on. Uh, knowing what you're sharing, who you're sharing it with, and actually, frankly, whether you're allowed to, that's going to become increasingly important. So we found this tool, it's a very useful way of saying actually, you know, of those digital things that you do use, I appreciate some of you might choose not to, but sometimes you have no choice. Of the things you choose to use, or the things you have to use, where do you spend the most time? And what's very interesting for me is that some of these, if you look right up at the top, and you won't be able to see this at the back, but it's got YouTube. And on, on this person's diagram, YouTube is very much, it's a, a personal thing. That's a, a personal thing. You know, probably watching cat videos, something like that. Um, that robot doing a backflip that was doing the rounds the other day. But your institution might be saying increasingly, oh, we're putting lectures, we're, we're doing lecture capture, we're putting them up on YouTube because we know everybody with any, every device can, can get to them. And there's an interesting psychological dynamic there. I view that as my personal area, you know, maybe like, like perhaps I view Facebook. And the institution starts to muscle in on that. Is there a bit of cognitive dissonance? Maybe I don't want to friend you on Facebook, you know, you're my lecturer. I don't want to friend you on Facebook, I don't want you seeing all my party photos. Come on. <laughs> and anyway, you all know I wasn't revising last night. <laughs> So we've got a few little tools like this, um, which uh, we'll, we'll share these slides so you get the, the links to them if you're interested. Um, another one that we think is quite relevant to this kind of audience is a tool that you can use to um, assess what we call your digital capability. So essentially are there areas where you're completely confident, you know, have no trouble at all with that, and then there are other areas where you're just learning, you're scratching the surface, you know that you could do a lot more than you do right now. And to pick an example on something like Excel spreadsheets, a lot of people um, are, are just scratching the surface of what you can do with Excel spreadsheets. And I once worked for a manager who didn't know that you could get things to add up automatically in Excel spreadsheets. So I'll say that now, you know, there's, there's a lot of stuff out there. So do take a look at that tool, I'd be happy to, to talk to any of you about it. Um, I, won't, I won't make this an interactive exercise, but I think it's interesting to reflect on how, how digital our institutions actually are. So um, if you come into higher ed quite recently, which I think is probably the, the, the case for quite a few of you here, you're probably used to, and previous employers you've worked for, have an IT system for this, have an IT system for that, and Pretty much everything that you need to do, there is some product or system or app that you use to do it. And Higher Ed has a lot of those, but a lot of them are very niche. They're very particular to the needs of Higher Ed, like a research management system, a virtual learning environment that you might not encounter. You might not encounter anything like them anywhere else. So on the one hand, there's a world of stuff that you'll encounter everywhere, your Excel spreadsheets, your Microsoft Office 365. And then there are these very niche higher ed IT systems. And the truth is there aren't a lot of them. And there's a sort of herding instinct. Most institutions are a bit reluctant to take a risk. So when a new product or a new product category comes along, what tends to happen is everyone says, well, you know, hold on. <laughs> uh, I'll let you have a go at that first. You know, we'll, we'll check back. We'll see how the guys down the road are doing. Give it a year or two don't to rush into anything. And, and this is a real um, challenge area, is to say actually when there's something, there's something quite innovative coming along, what's our risk appetite? How much of a risk are we prepared to take? And can we quantify the risk? So you know, we were talking about uh, GDPR earlier on. If I use this app and my students use it, where's their data go? Can I, can I look that up somewhere? Do I get a guarantee from the company that made the app? about where they're putting the data. So there's a lot of things that can be done to make that less risky, to de-risk it. And that, again, is something we're very interested in, in talking to institutions about. But there's also a lot of places where things could be more joined up 
than they are. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, the other day I was talking to uh, a company called Scientia that make a, a, a very widely used timetabling system. And I said to them, well, um, how does that connect to an academic's diary? So I've got my diary. Let's imagine I'm a lecturer. I, I've got lots of meetings. I'm supposed to do research and admin as well as teaching. How does your product connect to my diary? And I'm, I'm not singling out Scientia here because it's, this is true across the board. The answer is, it doesn't really yet. And there are these disconnects all the time. And you, you guys, I think it'll be very interesting to see, maybe you could feed back via, via Kevin, it'll be very interesting to see after you've been doing this, after you've been immersed in HE for some time, how many of those disconnects you see and how many of them are frustrating almost on a daily basis. You know, picture that academic who's sat there going, well, I know I need a room for, room for 250 people, um, <coughs> But I don't want to have to keep checking for diary clashes. And wouldn't it be great if the IT was just not in the way? It was just joined up enough. I didn't have to do that. So I think, I think you'll find a few of those sorts of things. I, I'd love to know what those corner cases, what those edge conditions are. At GIST, we're doing quite a lot of work on trying to join up the data. And we're working with a whole bunch of universities, uh, including Exeter, on joining up some of the data that's generated as you, as a student, you go around campus, you use a virtual learning environment, you use library systems, you go to lectures even, does happen sometimes. Um, all of those things nowadays tend to generate what, what I've called a digital exhaust. So somewhere on a, on a computer, a little record is made that something happened. And historically, what we've tended to do is to throw that away. Um, and actually, we're not, not particularly because we wanted to throw it away. It's because the disk drive's full. Oh, no, the server's full again. Why is that? Oh, it's all these log files, we, we call them. All these log files. I don't even know why we keep them. And that wasn't a very canny thing to do. And this is, this is becoming quite outdated practice now. What we're increasingly doing is saying, OK, the fact that someone's been through a barrier, that, you know, the fact that someone's used their smart campus card to buy some food at the, <coughs> at the forum, um, you know, the fact that someone's um, checked in to a lecture, all of these things actually help us to understand whether they're engaged with their course. And the more engaged they are, frankly, the, the more likelihood of them not just succeeding, but doing pretty well. And if we see that they're starting to disengage, um, that should set some alarm bells ringing. And I'm not suggesting that that means that uh, you know, they get an email saying, watch out, <laughs> you know, this is the university here, you're going to fail, fuck your act up. Actually, it's probably much more human than that. It's probably that their personal tutor gets a little flag that shows up, maybe on a dashboard like this. So, this is a product called um, Tribal Student Insight, which we're trialling with about 20 universities right now. It's part of something called our Learning Analytics Initiative. Um, this is going to become a service, and we're just about to take on another 20 universities. So it's probably going to be quite widely used. Uh, this isn't a real person, by the way. Well, it is a real person, but his name isn't George Reed, and he's a, he's a, mo a photo model. Um, what this dashboard is, is doing is just graphing a few of those stats that we were talking about. So aggregate a few of those interactions into a statistic, and then we can say, hmm, you know, so in a sort of traffic light style way, is George, not his real name, uh, engaged? Is he turning up? Maybe there's a problem. And if you're George's personal tutor, you can look at that dashboard, you can look at the historical stats, and you can say, you know what? I'm going to give George a call. I've got his mobile number here. <laughs> Hi, George. Can we have a chat? So it's not about a you know computerised message, anonymous, automatic. It's about it's about helping the humans that interact with that student to support them. So the the flip side of that is if you are the student, we've got an app which 
Uh, you can use to set your own study goals. So uh, in this screenshot, George has decided he's going to do a bit of reading. He's going to do half an hour a day of reading. And our app makes a little log of those things that you said you were going to do. Actually, did you do them? Well, I, I'm going to go to that 9 o'clock lecture. I absolutely am. I know I'm going out, but I'm going to, I'm going to be up in time. I'm going to do it. And this is where um, there's, a, there's a technique called gamification, which has gotten a lot of attention recently, which is essentially giving you a little virtual reward. So if you use an app, for instance, like Duolingo to learn a foreign language, you'll know you get little virtual rewards, virtual um, stars, trophies, or what have you. Um, and it's not the same as getting a real reward, but psychologically there is something going on there. So, so this, is, this is how we present this kind of information to a student. So we would say, look, you, know, you set your own goals. You can track how you've been uh, doing at meeting those goals that you set yourself. And oh, by the way, you know, this is your attendance record. <laughs> you might want to have a look at that. Um, so we, we think those, those things, they're here and now, and they've got a lot of potential. You might encounter that learning analytics stuff here at Exeter because you're one of the pilot institutions, so it'd be very interesting to hear people's feedback on that. Um, I'm going to take it in a little bit of a different direction now and look a little bit further forward. So it's time, time to play another game, and I call this game Utopia or Dystopia. And <laughs> so I'm going to start off with a question about driverless cars, or if you prefer self-driving or autonomous vehicles. You've been in the news a lot recently, the government's investing a lot of money in them. What do you think? Would you, would you be up for it? Who'd, who'd take a ride in a self-driving car? Put your hand up if you would. Mm. And who definitely wouldn't? And I'm guessing a few people are sat on the fence. Yeah, so actually for, for, the, for the video, I'd say that was, that was about a 50-50 a split, actually, with a few abstainers. So you're, you're quite... Um, what's the word I'm looking for? You're quite an adventurous bunch <laughs> when you think about it, because this is quite new stuff. It's quite new stuff. Um, here's another new thing. The government is quite keen on space as well. So if you, if you caught the, the budget um, yesterday, there were some announcements about space. Would you, would you do a bit of space tourism? What do you think? If you could just fly up there, maybe not the weekend break on the moon, maybe just flying up and coming back down again. Would, would, you, would you be up for it? Who's, who's up for it? Oh, <laughs> okay, so I think some of you definitely aren't. Who, who definitely wouldn't? Okay, so a few, a few people definitely wouldn't, but on the whole, you, you were up for it, so this is good. So your risk appetite, you know, we started off talking about how, how digital you are, and you're kind of, well, actually, you know, not, really, not really that much, but you are quite inclined to try new things, or maybe it's just space. Okay. Um, okay, now here's a here's a future thing that actually you can buy in shops, and, and I'm curious about this. But has anybody got internet connected light bulbs? They, they've been selling ah, so, ah. There's always one. So, <laughs> um, but we have got internet connected toothbrushes, even an internet connected lock. So Amazon announced the other day a lock that you can remotely unlock so the Amazon courier can drop your package off and it won't just get randomly propped up against your you know, front door or something in the rain. Um, and as someone who, got, who went out in the rain last night in Exeter, I, I wouldn't want my package <laughs> propped up against the door. Um, what do you think? You up for, are you up for connecting everything in your house to the internet? Would you, would you buy an internet connected toothbrush? That was it. Is anybody going to go, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll have a crack at that? Not really. Depends no. on if you wanted your toothbrush connected to the internet phone. Yes, absolutely. So, so if, you're, if, you, if you wanted your toothbrush to report back on your brushing activities, how effective you are. I get a little star, 
<laughs> and this one, this is a real, this is a real product. In fact, there's several products right now. And I think this is a really fascinating area because at, on one level you think, well, this is rubbish, this, this stupid idea, trying to put a chip into everything. And then, of course, I, like many of you, I went to the dentist recently and the dentist said, <sighs> you're, really, you're not getting that tooth at the back, oh, I've got to, got to put a filling in. And it did give me pause for thought because I thought, well, actually, I pay a, a fair bit of money to have that filling done. And if it gets really bad, I have to have a crown and that costs a heck of a lot more. Is there a point where actually the, the toothbrush pays for itself? Whether or not you think it's a gimmick, you know, if you use that toothbrush and it tells you that you keep missing this particular bit and you brush your act up, um, actually it might, it might save you money. So it, I think the dynamics is a very interesting one. Let's try our fourth one. This is the biggie. So. Um, DNA editing is becoming a thing. Um, if, you're, if you're in London now, there's a place called the Francis Crick Institute next to St Pancras um, Station, where this is basically what they do. They've got 1,500 researchers who are studying DNA, and a lot of them are studying how to edit DNA. So picture that you could be injected with, and this sounds like science fiction, but this, this is starting to happen now injected with a virus that rewrites your DNA to fix if you have a, a genetic defect in it. How do you do that? If you, if you have... Oh, I, that, I see a couple of people saying yes. Would, would you do that? What if it was your child? What if you knew that you were carrying a child who had a genetic defect that could be fixed? Where's the point where it becomes something that you would risk? And it's a very interesting question. I don't, I'm not going to ask you to kind of raise your hands for this, but I wonder if there's any immediate thoughts from people. You know, how, how established does something like this have to be before you'll, you'll take a punt on it? Anybody like to throw a comment in? So for the, for the video, um, the, the lady at the back was saying, that if you knew that you, if you were carrying a gene which had a very high probability of um, resulting in you developing something like a, maybe an aggressive form of cancer, maybe the balance of probabilities, you'd say, well, actually, do you know what? Um, nothing ventured, nothing gained. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give it a try. But maybe, a bit like some of these other things, maybe it will reach a point where we just say, well, actually... Do you know what? It's, it's become a common thing now. And, and um, I, would, I don't want to go too far down the dystopian line, but people are already talking about um, designer babies here. So it's not necessarily just about you know, um, knocking out a, a, a defective and mu mutated gene. It's, perhaps it's about, well, actually, I, I don't want a girl. You know, there are some cultures where um, female children are frowned upon. Um, I, I want a, a child with blue eyes, or something like that. And so that I, I don't want to go too far down the dystopia route because there's enough of that in the news every day. Um, but it's back to that moral imperative thing. As um, as people working in higher education, um, do, we, do we have a little bit of that? Do we have to keep asking ourselves, you know, what's what's the higher purpose of what we do? Because it's very easy to come into the office every day and there's processes that you follow, there's people that you see, there's meetings that you go to. But we often fall into the trap of, you know, not necessarily thinking so much about the, the bigger picture. And with that, and to lighten the mood a little bit, I bring you cats. So um, I'm going to talk about artificial intelligence for a little bit because I think this is a technology which it's actually already around us and, and it's used in quite a lot of the apps and services that you use every day. If you use something like Facebook, if you use Google Photos, Google Photos automatically classifies the pictures that you upload to it. And you can come along and you could search for cats. I keep meaning to upload a photo of a cat up a tree to see if I can search for cats up trees. So I might do that later on. Um, this, is, this is an artificial intelligence that draws pictures. So you do a sketch, which is the, the thing on the left, and it will try and make a picture 
It makes this. There is no cat. It's made a cat-like picture, uh, inspired by your sketch. The same AI also does, and it's a quite a weird combination. It does handbags, it does shoes, and it does buildings. So I don't know what made them, you know, hit on those four things. Um, and if you're into coding, actually, this is all open source code. So if you want to learn about AIs, if you want to learn about coding, you can actually literally download this and you can unpack it and explore it. So it's very interesting. But if you draw a monster, you get a cat monster, <laughs> or, or presumably a shoe monster. Um, I must try a shoe monster, actually. So it's still trying to make a cat. It's doing the best it can. But, you know, that, that thing in the middle, I'm not sure if it's meant to be an eye or a nose, that's particularly disturbing. Um, AIs that make things. So a lot of that stuff that's, that you use every day is about using AI to recognize things. You know, Google Photos, once you tell it this is a photo of my children, it will find other pictures of your children, it will put them together and boom, that's, that's done automatically for you. AIs that make things are quite a new uh, concept. So in this picture here, we've got three pictures, we've got a photo of a dog, we've got a painting, and then the big one is the, the two of those things kind of mashed up together. So it's made a thing that never existed anywhere before. It's turned the dog into a dog in the style of that painting. And I think they call it art artistic style transfer. So you can say, right, OK, I'd like this, but in the style of that. And that, for me, that's quite a profound thing, because, you know, I, I was never very good at painting. And if I could just kind of go, well, you know, can I have that, but in a little bit of a Picasso style? Or, you know, can you do me this doodle, but in a sort of a Salvador Dali style? I think that would be pretty, pretty cool. Um, where's that going next? Well, here's a guy who put the complete works of William Shakespeare into an AI. And now... And this is, again, this is all stuff that you can look at, so that he's got quite a lot to say about it in this um, blog. It now produces things that look like Shakespearean text. So you pause for a moment to, to consider that. So you can say, OK, uh, go off and make me something a bit Shakespearean. It knows about the characters, so if you can, if you can read the print, we've got um, Viola, we've got King Lear, but then you can in the same play. Um, and King Lear is saying, Oh, if you were a feeble sight, the courtesy of your law, your sight and several breath will wear the gods. Now, I have no idea what that means. But equally, I've read a, a fair bit of Shakespeare, and there's a lot of that that I couldn't understand either. And that feels quite Shakespearean. And there are some other examples that he's done. Uh, one, one that particularly... Um, appeal to me as a, as a sometime coder is he's got one that generates computer programs and it's been fed a whole bunch of, of computer code and that will go off and it will write computer programs. So if you kind of thought, well, uh, you know, is the, is the AI coming for my <coughs> job? This is a nice wake-up call for computer programmers because look, well, it's, <laughs> you know, it's catching up with you. It might be doing your job soon enough. Um, <coughs> I also wanted to say a couple of words about robots. So we've got a particular kind of idea of robots which has come through science fiction. It's the humanoid robot that you maybe you can talk to and interact with. And that, in recent times, last couple of years, has gone from being a bit ridiculous, a bit, bit sci-fi, to actually something that you can buy. So. This robot is called Pepper, and it's uh, owned by the, the mobile phone company SoftBank, which is kind of the EE of Japan, I suppose. And if you go to any one of their mobile phone stores in Japan, Pepper is the greeter. So Pepper will glide up to you, and you know, konnichiwa, and have you thought about you know, renewing your mobile phone contract. <laughs> We've got some great upgrades for you. It's maybe not the conversation you pictured yourself having with a robot. Um, you'll also see in, in these pictures 
uh, Pepper is, is flogging uh, coffee pods for Nespresso, and Nestle are planning to introduce over a thousand of, of these in their upmarket coffee pod outlets. And the one that I think is particularly interesting is the picture on the right where Pepper has what amounts to a, a, a stethoscope. And if you think about the number of times that you visit your GP or you go to see a, a consultant and you spend an inordinate amount of time telling them all about why you're there. And actually, um, if you could tell Pepper and then you get more quality time with the doctor themselves, that could be quite a good thing really because the doctor's time is very short supply. Um, if we had audio, unfortunately the audio is uh, not working today, but this is, this is actually Pepper in real life. Pepper went to visit the Financial Times. So this is a, a video you can watch on, on YouTube. This is Pepper waking up. And this is very much how you imagined a robot. You know, if you, if you watched um, sci-fi movies or if you read a, read a novel like me back in the, in the 70s when you were growing up. And Pepper is, Pepper is able to converse with you, but the truth is it follows a script. So this is, this is where we bring it crashing back down to earth. Pepper follows a script, and if you deviate from the script, sorry, I don't know, I've got to start again. So if, if Pepper is working as a greeter in a mobile phone store, or maybe uh, working in a university, coming out on open days and things, um, then, you know, hello, how can I help you today? Oh, I know about how to get to all the venues for the open day, or, you know, dear, uh, friend, I will help you to find your way around as a fresher or something like that. Um, this is all quite quite practical. So this is something that um, you might have thought of as science fiction, but like I say, it's they've, they've sold about ten thousand of these so far. Don't be surprised if you start to see it in like upscale shopping malls, uh, airport concourses, things like that. And I'm I'm waiting for the first university to introduce Peppers. So I keep playing people this video just to see if anyone will, <laughs> will take me up on it. Um, another sort of robot that I want to show you today is one that you won't see because it's beavering away behind the scenes. So you know when you click buy now on Amazon or quite a few other websites, there we go, they clicked buy, the robot wakes up somewhere deep in the warehouse. As you can see from the, from the note at the bottom, Amazon have, in fact, this is an old number that, that about, at that point, about 12% of Amazon's workforce was robots, and, that, and that's a few months ago, so that number has undoubtedly gone up. <coughs> Amazon's robots bring the shelf with the stuff to the human being that puts it in the box to send to you. You don't see any of this because you, you don't go in the warehouse, of course. That's the robots at um, one particular moment in time there. All those little dots were robots moving shelves around. So when you talk about robots, you kind of probably picture something like Pepper, but then there's an awful lot of robots that are much more industrial, they're much more functional. They do a particular thing, a bit like your dishwasher, your washing machine. It's a, it's a robot, really, but it just does the one thing. Um, for some reason, the, this robot is gendered, so it's called Betty Bot. I'll, I'll just leave that there. <laughs> but isn't it amazing, that trip that it does of spinning around to lift the shelf up and then carrying it away. The robots live in something called the human exclusion zone, which again, I mean, don't want to, don't want to go all dystopian on this today, but that's, that's quite a thing in itself. <laughs> so that's what Amazon are doing. But Amazon have another trick up their sleeve. It's in this uh, graphic here on the right. So this is something called the Amazon Picking Challenge. What Amazon are doing is they're working with computer science teams and robotic teams, uh, robotics teams at leading universities to figure out how to solve the, the final bit of the jigsaw puzzle, which is those pesky humans that put, put the stuff in the box so it can be sent off to you. So um, when, they, when they figure this out, they'll be at the point where one robot can bring your stuff to another robot, which will pack it to be delivered to you by some autonomous truck or maybe a drone. 
and there, and there won't be lots of salaries to pay. They work twenty four seven. You know, they you, you need to service them occasionally, <coughs> and they'll need charging up, but they don't need health care. You know, they don't need a pension and things like that. So the point of this is these things are these things are actually already here, but they're here in quite um, small concentrations. And we should expect that there'll be more of them. And we need to understand, going back to the moral imperative, we need to understand <coughs> as higher ed folk, how, how do we prepare our students for this, but also what impact they, are these things going to have on us, on our workplace, on our, on our patterns of working? What opportunities are there? I'd like to think it, you know, we could go all dystopian, but I quite, I quite like the idea of looking at it in a positive way. Here's one take from uh, Stanford. So Stanford in the States has a project called Stanford 2025, which that, that now seems very soon. When they started it, it seemed further away. Um, Stanford's take on this is that it's not just about AI, it's not just about robots, you know, these are very specific things. There's a more general thing, which is people live longer, um, often the skills that they learn, the vocation that they thought they had, the profession that they went into, etc., changes. And our model of education is very much this, this front-loaded thing, right, you, you specialise, you get your accreditation, you get your vocational qualification or whatever, and that sets you up, and then you do the thing that you've qualified for. And I love Stanford's squiggle. This is the main reason I'm showing you this slide, is the squiggle, because their, their take on it is much more of what uh, Charles Handy called a portfolio career. You'll do a bit of this, and then your interests will take you in another direction, or maybe you know the robots will put you out of a job. But fundamentally, you won't just specialise in one thing, carry down a particular trajectory anymore. But they also think that a byproduct of that is that your education, it really will be lifelong learning. It will be much more profoundly continuous than our um, model of education is right now. So um, six years over a lifetime is the, is the heading that you won't be able to see down there, versus four years in the ages of kind of 18 to 22. So you might take a view. How, how many of you would say that, that we're kind of already over here? Does this feel like now, or does this feel like it's a, a future that might not happen? Who, who feels like we're kind of there now? Mm. So for the video, that's about half of the folk in the room. And who feels like that's a, a future? Who feels like it's a future that won't happen? So we've got one. You're the holdout. <laughs> and, but the truth is we don't know. We don't know. But we do know that there's a, a, a huge range of uncertainties. Um, you know, Brexit was mentioned earlier on, and that's just one of many huge uncertainties. So it's probably worth keeping in mind that if, whether or not you feel that that's where we're headed, or even that we're, we're starting to, to get to that point already. Um, what happens if we do get there? And some of the modalities that we take for granted right now might change quite drastically. Uh, which leads me back to space. So here's a thing. <laughs> um, who would have thought... I have to break it up a little bit, you see, so I'm going to leap back to space. Who would have thought that we're actually going to have spaceports in the UK. So this is the, the government's official guidance. If you fancy running a spaceport, uh, you can go to this web page and you can, essentially it sets you up to apply for a license to run a spaceport. So the government's been very far-sighted about this and they've said, um, you know, we're not just going to sort of pick, cherry-pick somebody to run spaceports. If you can prove that you, you've got your act together, will issue you a license, and good luck to you. You know, if you can get somebody to pay you to launch a satellite or, you know, take people on, uh, you know, weekend breaks to the moon, well, good for you. You know, you just have to satisfy us that you're, you're um, you know, capable. And why is that relevant to HE? Well, when I, when I did this, a version of this talk at uh, the Vice-Chancellor's Conference, 
I was able to point to, this is the consortium involved in uh, Glasgow Prestwick Airport's bid to be a spaceport. There's University of Glasgow, Dundee, Strathclyde, Edinburgh and Heriot Watt. All those universities are on board with this. And, and for me, that, that's a, a, a really nice counterpoint to all of the uh, dystopian memes going around right now. All of those HEIs are on board with this. So, some of you might have seen this next slide already. Uh, Glasgow Prestwick isn't the only place that wants to be a spaceport. Somewhere else that wants to be a spaceport is Newquay, Newquay Airport. So that's called Spaceport Cornwall. And it's very likely that they will get it. So you picture that. We're not that far away. I know it would take a long time to get there because I have driven on roads in Cornwall. But um, <laughs> if, you, if you travel by rocket, it will no be a swing, <laughs> <laughs> um, this is, this is probably going to be announced, if not in the run up to Christmas, then shortly afterwards in the new year. So there are things like this where we can, we can do something. You know, it's that one, that is just down the road. I don't know if Exeter University is involved in that. It'd be, be interesting if anybody from here knows anything about that. Looking around, not this audience. Henry, uh, you involved in that? Yeah. Hello, remote yeah. viewers. <laughs> I'm sure somebody must be, but it's not us. <laughs> okay, thanks. Not to worry. But, but that kind of thing, I think, is, is it's a very nice counterpoint to the, to the doom and gloom that, that's been spread uh, quite a lot in, in the media right now. There's a huge opportunity. And actually, the UK already um, launches... Well, the, the UK builds nearly half of the small satellites in the world, so we're already a space leader. We just haven't had the ability to launch the things ourselves. And you take something like that, and I have another example that I'll kind of close off on. But take something like that, and you can ask yourself, right, well, that's, this is not something that's happening in California. It's not happening you know, on the other side of the world. It's happening literally just down the road. What can we do? What can we do that would help that to succeed? What's our role in it? What part could we play in it? Um, and so I'm, I'm just kind of wrapping up, and then I thought we could spend a few minutes discussing some of these points. Um, what I wanted to kind of close off with here is, I think High Red has largely escaped so far the sort of uh, so-called disruption, I put the scare quotes on, um, that we've seen in, in for instance, the uh, music industry, uh, retail bookshops, I don't know, when did you last visit a travel agent? There's lots of industries that have been quite profoundly changed by technology. I would like to say Higher Ed has been pretty astute in adapting, taking advantage of the technology and not letting the technology and the technologists trample all over it. And I uh, hope long will it be so. There is a, a catch though because the tech industry's appetite for people who understand this stuff is absolutely insatiable. So high red not only needs to keep adapting, but also I, I would suggest step the pace up a little bit. Uh, I've got a particular example here to illustrate. This is the other thing I said I'd mention. Um, this picture is uh, to promote a course on learning to be a self-driving car engineer. So you know, everybody's talking about it, but the truth is no one knows how to do it. There are a small number of people who know how to do it. And Udacity, which is a Stanford spin-out, has this course, which is a bit like an online master's degree. You pay a few thousand dollars to do it, it takes several months. And you're mentored by somebody who works in the motor industry on self-driving cars. So hold that thought for a second. So. Udacity have come along and they, they basically said, well, everybody wants this. Um, Mercedes-Benz want it and, and NVIDIA is a big supplier of the hardware for these things. They want it. Uh, in fact, this is an old slide. This is over a year ago. By now, pretty much everybody in the motor industry wants to do this. Where do we get the people from that can do it? And so Udacity have just completely bypassed high red and just said, oh, we'll just... 
we'll do it with the motor industry, we'll develop some stuff online. There is no, there is no university professor research group or anything like that affiliated with this. This bit purely commercial high red, and it's focused on this one very specific and pressing need. How long would it take your institution to spin up something equivalent, or how do you collaborate with them? See, these, these kinds of questions I think are going to be increasingly important. Also, <laughs> overnight, from all over the world, I don't know if you can make out all the little dots on the map, literally overnight, 20,000 people from all over the world said, yeah, I'm in. I'll, I'll put, I, I forget the number, I think it's about $3,000. Yeah, yeah, my $3,000, I'm in, you know, when do I start? The truth is they can't take all those people on. Because they need the mentors in the industry, they can only take on a cohort of about 250 at a time. So there's this massive demand in an area of profound technological change. It should be a, a massive opportunity for HEIs. And that's kind of my challenge to you guys is, where well, you see something like that, how do we kind of steer the ship nimbly to take advantage of that opportunity? So that's my, that's my kind of big upbeat um, <coughs> um, option to throw at you. But I think that we also need to keep in mind, we, we, we're often presented with um, AI particularly as a threat. A lot of people talk about that, you know, not AIs aren't just going to take our jobs, they're, you know, they're probably going to um, round us up and you know, put us in a zoo or something. Um, but the truth is, we've had a lot of new technologies um, since the Industrial Revolution in particular, the, the pace of change has been accelerating and accelerating. If you pick a particular example, and I've, I've got the washing machine and the mangle here. My parents had a mangle, I remember that. I don't want to go back to that, I'm quite happy with the washing machine. Um, but there will always be this bump when a new technology comes in. Um, it isn't necessarily profoundly a threat, it's just a change. And some of those changes actually have very positive um, benefits, like being able to fly those rockets. They're not flown by a human pilot. So let's go back to that moral imperative bit. I've, I've said it a few times now. Um, do we think that we could put, a, put our finger on that, the moral imperative for institutions? to make a positive difference in society. You know, a project like the, the Spaceport Cornwall project, how can we get behind something like that and really help it to um, take root, help it to be a success? Do we feel that's part of our mission? So I'm, I'm going to throw the, throw the mic back to you guys and I'd like to hear what, what you think. I'll put my contact details up. If anyone wants to get in touch and, <coughs> and talk about this, I'd love to have a chat with you.